Melody sales first blow sell. Hello, Flossom people. Welcome to the Salesforce Flossom channel. I'm very honored to be invited to speak at the Singapore User Group last December. Mini has asked if we keep a recording, but I think it is better for me to redo the presentation. So if you're interested, let's get started. This session is called All About Flow, where I will provide some basic introduction of flow and some important concepts you will need to learn when starting with flow. The session is divided into two parts. First part is the intro, where we will talk about what is flow, why flow, and who can do flow. The second part is the starter pack, where I will provide a list of important concepts and flow setup for you to go through. And at the end, I will provide some tips to advance as well as some good resource to help your learning process. So let's start with the introduction. What is flow? If we talk about Salesforce automation, there are two most important factors. The first one is complexity, meaning how difficult it is to use that tool. And the second one is flexibility, meaning what you can achieve with that tool. So if we put these two factors on a plan, we can actually draw all the automation tools on a straight line. This is telling us that all the Salesforce automation tool, their complexity and flexibility are proportional, meaning if it is easy to use, there will be a lot of limitation. On the other hand, if it's really hard to use, you can achieve a lot more things with it. But there's also another important factor. If we look at flow and apex, we can actually draw a line between them. To the left, this is what we call the declarative tool. And to the right, this is the programmatic tool. A declarative tool means that you only need to focus on the logic construction. While on the other hand, programmatic tool means you have to really code. So by having this graph, we can conclude that Flow is the most flexible yet complex declarative tool in the Salesforce automation spectrum. But then why Flow? If we compare Flow to both declarative tools and programmatic tools, there are actually several benefits. First, let's compare to other declarative tools. Flow is actually more flexible, like we just discussed about. Whenever I started with Flow, I was so surprised about all the things I can achieve with Flows. The second part is Flow is actually easier to debug. This might sound a bit counterintuitive because we just said that Flow is more complex. However, Flow provides the built-in debug mode, so you can test your solution within the same interface. This is what we didn't have when it comes to Workflow and Process Builder. Then we can also compare to the programmatic tool. The first benefit is it's easier to learn. If we exclude all the custom actions or components, the elements in Flow are actually quite limited, meaning that you actually don't have that many things to catch up in order to become a Flow master. The second benefit is it's quicker to develop than Apex. Because you can build your solution and test your solutions right away, you don't have to write separate classes just to test. I have to say, when I started with Apex, writing a test class is where I struggled the most. But I don't think we need to emphasize too much on why flow, because you should have known that at Dreamforce 21, Salesforce has announced that they will retire Workflow and Process Builder in the near future. So if you want to catch up on the automation train, right now it's a really important timing for you to start using Flow. But then who can do Flow then? I want to say everyone can and should. But when I said everyone, I actually mean everyone with basic Salesforce admin knowledge. Even though Flow is not that complex, it is still very difficult compared to Workflow and Process Builder. If you want to do Flow well, you really have to understand Salesforce basics like data model, sharing settings, and all the setup. And why do I say everyone should? This is because right now we can see a trend that digital transformation needs to happen really fast. That means the ecosystem right now is favoring the hybrid role. If you have the skill sets from both the business side and technical sides, you will have a really good opportunity in the ecosystem. That would mean if you're an admin, right now it's really important for you to equip some technical knowledge. 
On the other hand, if you're a developer, right now it's very important for you to strengthen your communication skills with the business stakeholders. And Flow is the perfect platform for you to achieve this. For admin, if you learn Flow, you will have a better control of the org. It's easier for you to know what happens in the back end. Also, later on, if you want to learn Apex, it will also be a lot easier. Finally, if you're a business role and have some technical knowledge, it's going to help you have better recognition in your job setting. Then let's look at developer. The first benefit will be it will help you to manage the technical debt a lot more easy. The way you can build flow is a lot more limited than Apex, meaning that you can also find the structure a lot quicker. So that's going to help you maintain the automation with less effort. The second point is it will also help you get a better recognition. I always think that it takes another good developer to know how good your codes are. But when it comes to flow, because now you can communicate more easily with a business stakeholder, you can let more people know what is your capability and what's your problem solving skills. So learning flow provides a lot of benefits for both roles. So that's our introduction. And now we're going to move on to the starter pack. The first part of this is the important concepts to learn when you start with the flow journey. Here, I assume you are familiar with workflow and process builder already, and then you're transitioning into flow. So the first concept that is really important is debug and error handling. This is something that we didn't really take care that much when it comes to workflow and process builder, because when it comes to testing, we always test it in the UI. However, in flow, there are many places that you can make mistakes. So it's really risky to activate your solution without a proper testing. So in this case, we need to utilize the debug mode that flow provides. Also, before I started with flow, I always find the error message very intimidating and I never read them. I just didn't have a clue what it means. But when it comes to flow, the error message is the best friend for you to build an efficient solution. So right now, it's very important for you to understand how to handle the error and to read the error messages. The second part is variable and collection. They do exist in workflow and process builder, but we just never have to handle them explicitly. But the key of making your flow flexible is actually on how you can manipulate the variable and collections. So when you are using flow, it's very important to understand what they are and what they can do. The third is loop. Loop is a very important programming concept that exists in every programming 101 courses. It's basically just doing the same actions again and again. And this is also a very important concept when it comes to flow. The next is before and after save trigger. Flow provides more fragmented triggers than workflow and process builder. So we need to understand what is the use case for each one. It will also be a plus to understand the order of execution because that's the key to understand what really happened in the backend and what's the interaction between your different automation solutions. The next one is SOQO and DMO. I find this quite funny because when we were doing workflow and process builder, I feel like we were never expected to understand what they are. But when it comes to flow, we are just expected to know them without any proper documentation or training materials. So when you first heard about this term, you might find it really intimidating. But in short, SOQO and DMO are just two different languages controlling different operations. SOQO controls the read operations and DMO controls the write operations. And in flow, we need to understand which element will code for which operations. And the next one is also really important is the governance limits and the general limits. We have to understand what is the limits for one flow interview and flow actually follow the standards Apex governance limits. So by learning this, you will also have a better understanding of what Apex is. Besides from the governance limits, there are also other general limits, like how many elements you can have in one flow and so on. The next one is the running context. Flow provides three different running contexts. More strictly speaking, is two different contexts. So the first one is the user context, meaning that the flow will run as if it's the current user. So all the field permission or the record permission will apply. 
the next one is system contacts, but it also has two different settings: system contacts with sharing or system contacts without sharing. System contacts means that the flow will run as an admin, but with sharing and without sharing means that which records the flow can access. So here, only the record permission will be different. So based on your scenario, it's also important for you to know which contacts you should use. And finally, the last one is how to launch flow. When it comes to workflow and process builder, the trigger you can choose are very limited. But in Flow, you have many different triggers that you can use. So we have to understand what are the possibilities and when to use which one. So that is a quick summary of all the important concepts you have to catch up when it comes to Flow. And what you can see is everything are actually all related to Apex. This is also why I said if you're familiar with Flow, it will be a lot easier for you to learn Apex going forward. And the second part, we want to talk about different types of flow. I separate them into two categories. One is can have user input, and the other one is no user input. Can have user input means that you can have a screen for people to fill in some data. But notice I say can here because you don't have to have it; you just have the option to. So on the left side, we have our famous screen flow. And on the right side, the first one we have the record trigger flow. This flow will run whenever a record is changed. And the second one we have schedule trigger flow. This flow will run on specific schedule. And then we have platform event trigger flow. This flow will run when the platform event is received. But this is mainly for building integration. So if you're not responsible for building integration, it's very unlikely that you will build this flow. And lastly, if there is no other triggers and there is no user input, it's what we call the auto-launched flow. So here, for screen flow and auto-launch flow, if you want to run them, you will have to design some manual triggers like buttons or actions. And for auto-launch flow, you can use Apex or other flow solution to trigger it. I I think I have done speaking all the good things about flow. But to become a flow master, it's also really important to understand the limitation of flow, mainly what flow cannot do. And here is a quick summary of a few things that flow cannot do. The first thing is flow couldn't provide more flexible screen interaction. As of now, the standard screen components are quite limited. So if you want to have, for example, like real-time interaction between different components, you will have to leverage the custom component solution. The second thing is the partial DML operation. In Apex, we have this thing called partial DML operations, meaning that you can successfully update some of the records even though the rest of the records fail. For example, if today you're updating a hundred records and ten of them fail, you can still ask the system to update the rest of the ninety records. However, that option doesn't exist in Flow. If there's any failure in your records, the whole operation will fail. The third thing is Flow cannot handle really large amount of data because Flow is just not designed for that purpose. So if you're handling large amount of data on a regular basis, leverage Apex or bulk API solutions. Finally, Flow also couldn't build custom web services because it's just not yet supported. So if you're building custom REST services or SOAP services, you will have to use Apex. All right, finally. My personal tips of how to advance in Flow. First one is I recommend everyone to start with Screen Flow instead of Record Trigger Flow. I know Record Trigger Flow is closer to Workflow and Process Builder, but in a sense, it's actually harder to debug and to visualize. By using Screen Flow, you can put your variables on a screen, so you can visualize what's happening inside the flow. So if you just started, I highly recommend. Playing around with screen flow. The second thing is remember to test a lot. If you transition from workflow and process builder, you might carry the old habits, which is you would just test it in the UI. But when it comes to flow, like I said, there are many places you can make mistakes. So make sure you always test a lot. Also, by testing a lot, you can know what exactly happened in your flow solution more easily. 
The third thing is know the don'ts. Many people will be asking, "What is the best practice of building flow? How can I tackle these solutions?" In my opinion, I think flow is very flexible, meaning that many people will have many different solutions. So you shouldn't be looking at the only one solution that works. Rather, you should know what you shouldn't do in flow and try to avoid them. The rest just let your creativity fly. The next is practice with cases. Knowing the concept is one thing, but knowing how to use them is another. If you really want to advance in flow really quickly, make sure you find a lot of examples that you can practice along. The next one is review your flows periodically. This still happens to me when I look back to the flows I built maybe six months ago. I will find many different mistakes that I shouldn't have made. So by reviewing your old flows, you can really see how your learning journey has become, and you can always keep reminding you not to make the same mistakes again. So if you have time, go back to the old flows that you built and try to make them into a more efficient solutions. Lastly, I really recommend this: train your logical thinking, and you don't have to do that by using Salesforce. You can, for example, play Sudoku puzzles, escape rooms, any kind of things that will help your logical thinking. The reason is that, like I said, flow is still in the declarative tool spectrum. So what we are focusing on is the logic construction. If you're really good in logical thinking and problem solving, you will find flow become a lot easier. So in your spare time, remember to train your logical thinking. And this is a shameless plug. If you're looking for easy explanations of the concept, use cases that you can practice on, video tutorials, or even free consultation, you can always come to our website and YouTube channel. Finally, is the list of really good resources that I use on a regular basis. These are very famous blogs, but if you don't know them, make sure you pay a visit. That's it for our All About Flow session. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, and turn on notification. Salesforce Blossom, thank you for watching.